stretches across northern Africa. Over 9 million square kilometers of the harshest landscape on Earth. Searing heat by day, bone chilling nights. This is one of the most unforgiving places on the planet. Arriving here are four men on a mission to set an unusual world record. Their goal is to cover over 2,000 kilometers of this barren landscape, and they're going to do it by kite buggy. The terrain is proving to be so, so arduous. It's quite soul destroying, really. These lightweight machines are powered by kites, have no brakes, and can exceed speeds of 100 kilometers per hour. In a volatile desert environment, kite buggies can be deadly. They've called this expedition the Mad Way South. The planning for this adventure began nine months earlier on the beaches of the Gold Coast, Australia. And it all started with a single moment of madness. It's like one or two in the morning, I roll over, wake up my wife, go, hey, Hey Sarah, do you reckon anyone has crossed the Sahara Desert by wind power, by kite buggy? This is Jeff Wilson. By occupation, he's a veterinarian, but his real passion is extreme adventure. Before thinking up this crazy challenge, Jeff had never even driven a kite buggy. Joining Jeff, is fellow Gold Coaster, Garth Freeman. Garth is a professional kiting instructor and a master when it comes to harnessing the power of the wind. But this is not just an adventure, it's also a race. Across the Tasman, two New Zealanders living in Christchurch have teamed up to take on the Australians for world record glory. And just like the Aussies, this team also consists of an expert and a novice. Meet Craig Hansen. He not only designs and builds kite buggies, he's also one of the world's best at driving them. With a former military background, Craig knows how to prepare for the challenges of Sahara. The agreement with Jeff was that I would get myself a handicap and he would find himself a kite instructor so I went out and found myself a handicap, which happened to be Steve. I'm definitely handicapped. <laughs> Steve Gurney is a New Zealand sporting legend, an accomplished extreme adventurer. He's a nine times winner of New Zealand's coast to coast endurance race. So the Sahara will play host to two teams going head to head for world record glory. Jeff Wilson and Garth Freeman make up Team Australia, the Aussies. They'll take on Craig Hansen and Steve Gurney of Team New Zealand, the Kiwis. For nine months, these two teams prepare independently for the race. Speed, boys, good speed, straight down, nice work. The Aussies train on the windy beaches of the Gold Coast. It may not be the Sahara, but at least they've got sand. And Jeff is learning how difficult these buggies are to master. In Christchurch, the Kiwis can only practice on grasslands. And the conditions are terrible. Steve Gurney is wondering if he's taken on too great a challenge. The logistics of preparing for a 2,000 kilometre desert race are enormous. I'd say top end is going to be rough as hell. Yeah, like yeah. Top the teams will pass through four African countries and will face extreme weather conditions, terrain littered with landmines and possible attacks from desert bandits. 
go down to where the landmines are. This this border here, Western Sahara and Mauritania, has got a minefield 250 kilometres either side of it. Oh, okay. A support team of guides, mechanics and crew are assembled. Vehicles, equipment, food and supplies are all shipped prior to the team's departure. The journey to the Sahara begins with the long flight to London. Rock and, roll. and it's here where the teams meet for the very first time. I can hear some of that nasal twang coming up the driveway, so it's probably the Australians coming. Hey, Kenny! <laughs> I've always been nervous about what's the team going to be like, how are we going to get on, and you know, it's a long time, we've got five weeks, we've got to be together, you know, living in each other's pockets, you know, it's not a holiday, you know, it's an, it's an expedition and there's a lot of things that we have to, a lot of challenges we have to overcome out there and I'm still really nervous about that. The first challenge is to pack down the gear they'll need for a month-long trip into the desert. <laughs> so how about we start with must-do stuff and leave at the back stuff that could possibly stay behind if we had to. I don't know why we put the camp chairs in, to be honest. Bloody camp chairs, jeez. We made it, we're here. Travelling south, the team meet up with the final member of the expedition and one of the most important, their desert guide, Guy Lancaster. Guy, good to see you. <laughs> Jeff. So not, good, not Jeff a, wrote to me and said we want to cross the Sahara by wind and I wrote back and said it's a totally insane idea but I love it. <laughs> We've got about 10 yards of England left. Once we're on that boat, it's take it as it comes. Heading to Africa, Jeff quickly makes his race intentions clear. I mean, there aren't many Everest left to climb, this is one of them. If a team member is killed in the process of the expedition, we all agree that we continue on. Agadir is the gateway to the Sahara and it greets the team with frightening temperatures. The heat last night, 45 degrees Celsius at 11 o'clock at night, that you really started to get this little fear inside that you know, we're at the northern part of the desert, it's only going to get hotter from here. But it's the heat of the moment the next day that gives Team New Zealand something to worry about. The Australians were in charge of packing the equipment before shipment and Craig isn't happy. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, carelessness. A lot of the stuff that came over was rusty, um, hadn't been looked after. Um, so people were just diving into the spare parts and grabbing the spares and leaving the crappy ones on the site. And all our tyres that we brought from New Zealand were quickly put onto the Australian buggies. So got fully under my skin. Stand back. <laughs> The next day, the convoy leaves Agadir and heads deep into the foothills of the Atlas Mountains for the starting line. With just 24 hours to the race start, the team has a problem. Jeff Wilson has chosen to ignore Guy Lancaster's advice about the safest race route. We can't get lost in here because there's nowhere to be. 
This decision leaves Guy losing confidence in the expedition. If we, Guy reckons we can do 30k down the beach, I'm not too fussed about that. Once I think we're, we should do that all the way. Once we're off the beach, Guy, I agree with you, but at the moment there's only one track that we can take. I must admit I have quite a lot of worries about the journey ahead. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not talking about vehicles, I'm talking about human being who knows the yeah. terrain. And I've sort of revised my opinion from it's going to be very difficult to get to Dakar to we ain't going to get to Dakar. I'm not sure whether we've got a sound enough plan. Day one. It's race day. The teams wake to a blowing 30 knot wind. Perfect for the kites. The plan is for the teams to utilize the coastal winds and race south, passing through the countries of Morocco, Western Sahara, Mauritania, and into Senegal, stopping north of Dakar at the geographical end of the Sahara. It's a total distance of 2,200 kilometers, which is almost 1,300 kilometers further than the existing world record. The race is broken into stages and the teams will compete against each other and the clock to record the fastest possible time over each stage. The team that gets to Senegal in the shortest time wins the race and claims world record glory. The golden rule is to never leave your teammate behind. It's just going to be that constant effort every day for the next 30 days just until we cover it. I think we just have to take it one day at a time and don't think too far ahead because uh, if you did you might get a bit scared. <laughs> Three, two, one, go! The opening stage takes the buggies through the coastal town of City Ifni. Team New Zealand quickly race to the lead. You can see their buggies in just from the uh, tyre marks. They're just sliding. And for about like 100 metres back there, you can just see them trying to wash off speed as, and then eventually sort of turned up wind. As Jeff struggles to fly his kite in the strong winds, Within minutes, Team New Zealand are vanishing into the horizon. Oh, they're just completely out of view. Ah. But matters are about to get worse for the Aussies. No, the support team has lost radio contact. The Kiwis are in front and we've been able to get radio contact with them. Um, but the Australian boys aren't answering and they should actually be closer to us to receive radio contact. As daylight fades, the fears for Team Australia continue to grow. That day went along the beach and we're just trying to navigate our way in at the moment. It's now been over 10 hours since the support crew have had contact with the Aussies. And now they've lost contact with Team New Zealand. The search for the teams goes on all night and into the next day. Hey guys, are there any mad buggies out there? Jeff, 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 you on channel mate? Get me aware we've got some lines down, um, I'll tell you when you're getting close. Good morning to you, mad bastards. These crackling words from Team New Zealand bring instant relief to Lance. What a day. The first day buggying, and my God, did we get some adventure. Two hours later, Team Australia come into view. No light, we had poor wind, dirty air, and uh, yeah, finally this morning after a full night bugging, I think we've been bugging for 
oh, I couldn't even tell you, 15, 16 hours or something. After just a few hours sleep, the team set off again. Waiting for them is an endless sea of rock. Jeff is struggling with his kite constantly dropping his sail into the thick thorny shrubs. Which means Garth is forced to wait for his teammate. After three hours, the teams approach the township of Tan Tan, where they're forced to lower their kites and pull the buggies. Too many buildings and high wires, so having a hike our way out and then get into Team Australia have had enough. They're exhausted. Despite good winds, they insist on resting for the remainder of the day. I think a good night's sleep will be good. And then we can get a good couple of hundred k's tomorrow. It's a decision that frustrates Stephen Craig. A little bit gutted. We've got wind, we've got light, we've got a road, and uh, everybody's going home to bed, which is very, very annoying. The next day, the wind is heartbreakingly still. The teams have traveled a total of just 200 kilometers. And with 2,000 kilometers still in front of them, the teams know they have to keep moving. The race rules allow the buggies to be pulled by foot if there's no wind. So, under soaring temperatures, the teams tether themselves to the buggies and begin the back-breaking task of dragging the machines across the desert. The hours on foot stretch into days, leaving the teams mentally shattered and physically exhausted. I cast my mind back to the first day. I was really optimistic then. However, things have changed over the last two days. Uh, we haven't had the winds we wanted, the, and then the terrain has turned into something pretty ugly, actually. Physically exhausted. It's the morning after uh, just a horrendous day yesterday. We had light wind, ended up pulling the buggies in the heat. Our dreams of crossing the Sahara, two and a half thousand kilometers fast fading if we don't get more wind. We'll give it another day or possibly two days and see how progress is uh, and then really seriously consider whether we should pull the pin. The train's really taking a beating on them. They've just had to suck it up and just walk. They really have to start getting the kilometres now. And um, yeah, it's sort of, hopefully this afternoon the wind will come up and they can get it. Late in the afternoon, the wind finally surges and the buggy set sail. Bigger kites allow the Aussies to make it 
brake on the Kiwis, who are having their own share of problems. With the wind beginning to drop, Team New Zealand work hard to try and pull back some time. But it's all in vain. The Aussies have already crossed the line and won the stage. Oh, how good is this last like oh. 20 minutes of wind? Oh, Which is enough. That's all it took, 20 minutes for us to catch them, beat them. One minute we're just going, I don't want to be here, this sucks. Yeah. And then, look at this, we're, we're in it. Uh, we're really at the edge of the dunes now. So good. Just Makes it all me. worth the pain. Team New Zealand arrive a short time later, and while Garth and Jeff bask in their victory, Craig is determined to race on. I personally don't want to stop. I want to keep going. Yeah. I don't know if the rest are going to want to do that, but there's no point in wasting wind. We've been battling all day for wind, and now we've got it. If we go to sleep, we'll be blooming criminal. This time, the Kiwis get their way, and the race goes on long into the night. day of ups and downs but uh, yeah the the main thing out of the whole day is that we know that the Kiwis can be beaten which is exciting because we got ahead of them today and not through anything other than just hard work and pers persistence we were sticking at it going 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 right so we're um currently Near the salt pan here. Today we hope to get to our milestone of 500 kilometres, which will be huge. And to have wind all day, I reckon we'll do it. It's, it's, we're probably only 80k off it. Yesterday's win has lifted the Aussies, and they're planning on a big performance in today's stage. But it's not long before they hit trouble. Jeff seems to be spending most of his time out of the buggy regathering his kite. And Garth isn't helping the situation. You're having a major freaking drama and he'll sit in his buggy 20 metres away just listening to his iPod. And like I, I shouldn't need help, but the reality is on occasion I will do. I just feel like it's the Garth team and then the Jeff team. I'm thinking clearly and working as a team without the pressure of keeping up with you all the time yeah. when you're on the horizon and I'm completely isolated. And it's just too dangerous terrain for me to be out there completely isolated. If I don't feel like my team member really gives a crap whether I live or die, then we're not a team. The reason these guys are ahead is that, to all intents and purposes, Craig is coaching them through. Yeah. The Kiwis have had a problem-free day and continue to surge ahead at a rapid pace. So smooth on the dune. A little from the wheels. Late in the afternoon, Team New Zealand easily win the stage. The Aussies limp home over an hour later. The teams have now covered the first 500 kilometres and New Zealand leads the race by 3 hours and 12 minutes. Hey mate, check that out. No, oh no, it's Jeff the Wrecker again. All this hard racing has come at a cost. The buggies are falling apart. The gear is copping and beating. We broke three kites yesterday and three of the buggies have got stress fractures in their frame, mine being the worst. Oh, smack! Oh, 
That's not good. No, Matthew, you can't go with that. We've had another day in the desert. Um, we've done our biggest mileage today yet, which is very, very encouraging. Uh, the downside is that our buggies just can't take it. So we're going through our gear faster than we can um, replace the bits. The desert is testing every single piece of our metal, both physically, mentally, and all the metal of our gear. We're going through kites, lines. It's just, uh, well, more than, more than we could bring with us. At first light, Lance and Guy head to Dakla to repair the buggies. While back at camp, the teams consider how they can continue the race. I afford many more of those. <laughs> oh, yeah. mm. I mean, it's just knee jerk mm. a lot of the time. With some clever alterations, they've converted some equipment trailers into buggies. They're small, not very stable, and dangerous to drive. But it means they can keep racing. They're tiny, you know, it's like driving a, a VW Beetle across the desert as opposed to a four-wheel drive. They're not built for it. They mightn't even last the day. It's not long before they realise how difficult these buggies are to control in high wind. Even Craig is finding it tough going. <sighs> Very frustrating. They're freaking dangerous. And Jeff is completely out of his comfort zone. We should have just had a day off, sorted out the big ones. Instead, someone's going to get hurt today. And Jeff is right. Hey, uh, Gus, Gus, Steve's got a significant head injury. He's getting to the top of the ridge and then into the vehicle. Steve Gurney uh, has had a terrible accident. Got to get him to a hospital as soon as possible. Poor old Steve, we to cut his glasses out of his eyebrow were mashed right into his face. The blood streaming out of his nose. Uh, shoulders gone. I don't know how he's st standing actually. I saw what happened. I just don't know how he's standing. The cart lifted him and the buggy up but the wheel was last to leave so it turned it upside down and just pancaked him into the side of the rocks and he hit hard. I just it was horrible. Steve's condition is deteriorating. Hey mate, we need a really good walk. The major worry initially was that Steve had a real loss of consciousness just from the head knock, and I was worried he had a brain bleed. We're going to take him to the nearest hospital, which uh, we have no idea where it is. Going to the no. Uh, where are you going to go? Once he's had an x-ray, determine whether or not the race goes on. By morning, the full extent of Steve's injuries become clear. Steve has a fractured face, a six centimetre piece of bone has broken off his shoulder blade and his rotator cuff is torn. His Sahara adventure looks to be over. In Dakla, Lance and Guy are unaware of the drama that's unfolded with Steve's accident. They've come here to get the buggies repaired and then wait for the team's arrival in the next few days. Oh, what do you think could be stronger? No? Just watching the setup of it was crazy. You know, he's got kids helping him with grinders that are bigger than their heads, you know, just laying on the floor. And um, the actual welding was all done with just sunglasses. He had his son standing there watching on, no protection at all, just watching his welds. It's like madness, absolutely madness. Dagla is a major tourist town, famous for its kite surfing beaches. It also represents the 1,000 kilometre point in the expedition. crew have decided to push on. Team New Zealand is now down to just one competitor and Craig is determined to hold the lead. 
strong winds and safe terrain allow the teams to cover over 350 kilometers during the next three days. Almost a Dakar. <laughs> In Cape Beaujador, Steve Gurney has checked himself out of hospital. It takes more than that to kill a Gurney, I'll tell you. of locals looking on, Craig brings his buggy over the line first, followed by Jeff and Garth. Hi. Damn, I missed you guys! This is so much! New Zealand now leads the race by 3 hours and 22 minutes. 10 days in the desert, 1,000 coast. Such an achievement for all of us as a group, for the support team, we couldn't have done it without them. Uh, for Jeff, whose vision it was, great day for pedal and kites, for um, us in New Zealand who made the buggies, and for the kites themselves, which have taken a beating. As the celebrations continue, Guy Lancaster prepares to tell the crew some distressing information. Okay, um... I'll just pass this round and it's just marks instances of mines going off. And as you'll see, it's more widespread than we thought. The buggies are about to enter into a danger zone. Unexploded landmines scatter the desert for the next 250 kilometers. Most of these military devices were laid during recent conflicts, but some date back to World War II. Every year, they claim the lives of innocent victims. This territory between Dakla and Mauritania is also a desert bandit hotspot. Kidnappings and deadly attacks are common. Steve Gurney may be down, but he's not out. He's ready to jump back into his buggy. We're putting Gurney back together. I'm uh, pretty excited about flying a kite again, but apprehensive as well, because uh, who knows how it's going to go. We're strapped up, so it should protect it. Guy Lancaster has called on local guides to help get the crew safely through the next stage. But he soon finds that they have a very casual attitude to the dangers. Having local guides was so that we could get local information about geography and the route ahead. Um, whereas the most that they could say would be, no, 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 not here, boom! <laughs> We've only got, what, there'd be 50k the other side of the border, so we're about 200k more of mines and then we're out of mine country. With the dangers ahead, the teams know that survival is far more important than the race itself. For the first time, they'll need to work together. So it's really important that Guy does his job. It's also really important that we get a bit of, bit of favour and uh, get, get through it. Don't step from the road in more than 10 feet. Mm -hmm. And bandits at least till 200k the other side of the border are an issue. They seem to use that border region as in a lawless area, mm. so we've got to seriously look out for each other for the next at least 400k. For sure. Looks military to me. Does, doesn't it? Military ordnance. Just before they head off, there's a deadly reminder of what lies in waiting. Okay, mate, if, if there's things like that, there'll be unexploded ones lying around because they don't all go bang. Teams are now restricted to the main road. Any deviation into the dunes by the buggies could be disastrous. The minefields are a constant threat. It's quite nerve-wracking. You see wreckages of vehicles that have hit mines. You see absolutely no tracks off the main road. Everywhere else in the desert is just a network of crisscrossing tracks. 
in Western Sahara, you've got your main thoroughfares and that's it. Everyone's too scared to get off the beaten track because it's just peppered with minefields. Because of the direction of the wind, a lot of the time we have to be on the wrong side of the road so that our lines aren't crossing over the road. Afternoon brings strong winds and difficult flying conditions. The buggies are constantly being dragged to the edges of the road and the kites are coming down. Retrieving them could be deadly. You know, it's hard to describe. Your heart goes boom, 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 boom as you're walking through what is a known mined area. The strain of the situation finally takes its toll when Jeff accidentally forces Craig off the road. Craig, 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 uh, we've got a vehicle, Craig. Right? I got forced off the road because you're flying your kite badly. Okay. And uh, I got car forced into oncoming traffic and I'm upset about that. There was a car. You know, I, I don't want to see any more fighting. I just want to know how to get on from here. I don't think there's any fighting. Up. It just pisses me off that... Like if anyone should be frustrated, I drop more kites than anyone and I'm keeping my cool, keeping my head. The two best kites in the group are throwing panties and it's not okay. Do you want me to have a tantrum? I have a tantrum about that. Do you not okay. like when you, so you can see... So throwing, throwing tanties and using that kind of language is not helping at all. And if you're trying to help the situation, choose your language a little bit better. Mate. The tension spills over to the crew and Guy Lancaster. Just uh, get ready for him, he's probably going to be pretty fired up. So all I'm interested in is getting you guys safely yeah. to Dakar on time. And that is perfectly achievable now. Yeah. The only thing that's going to f*** you up is you guys. I'm not going to f*** you up. Yeah. Well, we need, what we need to do, I think, tonight, I mean, you know let's get through today. Let's just get through today. To be honest, the, the ups and downs really don't matter to no, me. It's, but it's, I, I've it's got crossing. to a position now where it's my way a bit more, or my way's the highway. The teams push on through the night so they can be clear of the landmine zone by morning. But morale is now at a low. Someone drops a kite, Steve flips a kite, ends up upside down, nearly breaks his neck. Oh, it was just a tough day. Garth drops a kite. Um, oh, just, you know, bad wind. Jeff drops a kite, shit, you're a bad kite flyer. You know, what the f is that? I'm over that. One thing that concerns me greatly is um, Jeff's ability to destroy kit in a very short period of time. He's gone through um, all his line sets, um, completely destroyed a kite today, and uh, continues to lose stuff at an enormous rate. Um, I'm not sure what drives it, but it, it's something that he needs to control um, because it jeopardizes the whole, the whole project. We had a very tense day yesterday, which is, I think, really our first one in all of this time. And we've we've really battled through some some stuff, you know. Um, is a testament to the maturity of the guys on the team, testament to the to the one goal and focus and drive of the guys, that it's taken this long for us to get to the point where where um, friction has reached ignition point. In private, the teams come together and reach a dramatic decision that will change the entire race. At the border crossing into Mauritania, Jeff drops a bombshell. After much toing and froing, we have come together to present to you guys the idea that it's going to be a lot safer if the four of us now join as a team and admit that it's been too dangerous through the mined areas, the areas with the bandits, 
just too much for us to go head to head anymore. So with your permission, we would like to call it a draw at this point. We can only do it by joining together as a team. Steve was very nearly killed the other day. When I got to him, I, I had great concerns about him having a brain bleed mm. and it's actually improved him. <laughs> <laughs> After 12 days of intense racing, covering nearly 1,300 kilometres, the two teams will unite and they'll work together to go for the record. The next 600 kilometres will take the unified team into the deepest stretch of desert yet. From the border of Mauritania, the buggies will travel south through the Bank de Agua National Park and then down to the coastline of Nuakchot. We have to make sure we everyone have fills have their water here. Yeah. If you get lost in this next section, then it's a death zone. As the desert opens up, the wind surges, creating the ultimate kiting playground. The last 13 days have been just so much hard work. This last three hours have made up for all of it. It has got to be the best bugging terrain I've ever seen. It's just out of this world. You've got this power source that you can spin and loop and twist. Just massive. And then after all the work to get the whole team here and then bang, you get this terrain where it's just a rush, you know, and your adrenaline's pumping, you know, Whoa, this is why I'm here. You know, if I, if I had to stop bugging now and go home, I'd be happy. Dust may have settled, but there's a deadly reminder of what else lurks in the Saharan sand. Amazing that this little guy can put you, put you away. Nest cafe with a bit of sand and a scorpion to add a little, little zest <laughs> <laughs> to my coffee. keep blowing and the buggies continue to consume the desert miles. are now just 400 kilometres from the finish line and world record glory. And it should be the easiest stretch so far. They'll follow the Mauritanian coastline south, crossing the border into Senegal. The finish line waits just beyond the township of St. Louis. It's day 17 and Africa is about to lay down yet another challenge. We've gone from the gods smiling on us richly to just complete debacle, you know. We've got the easiest terrain of the trip and it's like 40 plus degrees and no wind. It's impossible to escape the intense heat as they're forced to pull the buggies for the next two days. When the wind finally arrives, it comes in short bursts, but just as quickly it drops off and the buggies are reduced to a crawl.
smuggling spirits are lifted as they leave Mauritania and walk across the border into Senegal. We're here in Senegal, this is St. Louis, which is a fantastic, like, thriving French-feeling town. Like, the people are insane, they think we're completely mad and they're loving it. <laughs> the Senegal River marks the southern Sahara boundary. Waiting for the team on the other side is a finish line a new kite buggy distance record and an end to an epic journey. So when we get to the, to the other side, that's it. That's the official end of the Sahara. So we've done it. That's it. Yeah, yeah, everybody! But there's one last soul-sapping twist. You know, halfway the boat motor breaks down. You know, I mean, there's just this storm just circling us and then, like, you know, the storm passes over us. We end up paddling and then after jumping the tow to shore, so then I'm just going, this is wrong. We've had challenging winds, challenging ground conditions, broken faces, broken equipment, and here we are on the other side of the desert, so it's been a triumph. You see all the support crew standing there cheering and, and chanting away. Uh, it was such, yeah, such an amazing moment. Finally, they've made it. They're the first to cross the Sahara by kite buggy. Yeah. We're the first to cross the Sahara, you know? That's, that's, a, a, that's a big achievement and we're going to be in the record books for quite a while, I think. It's taken 20 days and they've covered 2,200 kilometres of some of the harshest landscape on the planet. as a race between two teams and became a triumph of the human spirit. Mad Way South, an extraordinary adventure.